Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining me. I am Peter. And today we're going to talk about a very popular topic. This is perpetually popular, how to improve your credit. And I want to take a new spin on this and talk about some of the things that you can do to improve your credit and some of the things that I see as the most common mistakes people make that end up hurting their credit, even though they think they might be helping it. So we're going to get into that today. But first, I want to throw out this disclaimer. We'll be talking about some different products, maybe some different strategies. Everything is going to be very generalized. And so what I want is you to seek out some professional help. If you're looking at any particular situation, don't take any of these as a recommendation or an endorsement. Everyone's got to pick a path and a strategy that is right for them. So what are we going to talk about today? I'm going to talk about the credit history and the score and the differences between them. I'm also going to share with you some strategies on how to raise that score. And then I'm going to share with you a few of the most common mistakes people make, the most common ones that I see working with people. So how does the history impact our future borrowing? So maybe you started off in the world, you had a student loan, then you got a credit card, maybe a car loan, a mortgage maybe some other loans, some other debts, those types of things. All of that history sticks with us for a period of time. And it's that history, the way we've handled those debts in the past, determine what kind of loans we can get in the future. That determines our credit worthiness. The only way to make a prediction on that is to look at our past. And so that's why what we've done in the past impacts how much we can borrow and if we can borrow it all in the future. And if we can, even what interest rates will be let money at. What is the report versus score? First of all, all that history continues to accumulate on your credit report, your credit history. Now, if you've been around for a while and you've had a lot of different loans and paid them off and different credit cards, your credit report might actually be pretty extensive. And so when you go out and ask for a new loan, what lenders don't want to do is go through all of that to try to make a determination if they're going to give you a loan. That's why the credit score has come into play. So it's really just a quick summary. Lenders can see that score and determine, hey, I want to lend to you. I don't want to lend to you. I want to lend to you at a certain interest rate. And there are two big providers of scores. One is the FICO, the Fair Isaac Corporation score, as well as a more recent one called the Vantage score, which is was designed in collaboration with a bunch of financial institutions. So they both have a score. The scale is very similar between the two, but they are a little bit different. And so you might see some variation when you're looking at them. Now, Credit history is not a reflection of your net worth. In fact, there are a lot of people with really high net worths, millionaires, billionaires, in fact, that might not have good credit. And on the flip side, you might have really good credit and you might not actually have much of a net worth. And in fact, in most cases, when you're talking to most financial professionals, the net worth is really the more important one. We want to get you to your savings goals, your retirement, maybe financial freedom or financial independence. The other thing it is not is a reflection of your self-worth. So even if you've had blemishes on your credit in the past, you maybe you've had challenges, maybe you've had challenges staying on time or making payments or some delinquent loans. That does not mean that you're a bad person. It's not a commentary on the quality person that you are. A lot of people go through financial stress, financial turmoil. And what we want to do is to really build on that and replace those blemishes with really strong behavior, with good behavior to help you have the best runway moving forward. So what are the keys to improvement? Now, this little pie chart here is actually a rough breakdown of how your credit score is calculated. And what you'll see here is 35% is payment history. And this is really going to exemplify why I picked two strategies to focus on. And the first one is pay on time. Your payment history records all the little payments that you've made, whether they were on time or they were slightly late or they were very late or whether you were delinquent or in default. And so those little marks appear on your credit report, and it's really important to have as many green marks as possible. So paying on time is the most important one. 35% of your score is made up of that. Now, the other big component here is the amounts owed. 30% of the calculation is amounts owed. And so the other strategy here is pay it down. So pay on time is one. And the other one is pay it down. How much money do you owe? And if you owe some money, whether it's on a credit card or in a loan or whatever it is, continue to pay it down. That's what we call credit utilization. How much of the credit that you have available are you using? And so that's a big piece of your score. How much of your credit are you using? Now, between those two categories, we are talking about 65% of your credit score. And that's why it's really important to focus on these two. Now, length of credit history, new credit mix, those are all components. And some of those you can manipulate more than others. But if you pay on time and you pay it down, 
you are going to be affecting your credit score in the most powerful way possible. All right. So one thing we have to remember here is when do things drop off of your credit history? So maybe you've made some on-time payments recently here, but maybe in the past you were late sometimes, maybe even had a loan, like a store credit card or something that charged off. The answer is that things will continue to show up on your credit report for seven years. Now, one of the things to keep in mind here is that the older they are, the less weighted they are too. So your most recent behavior is what counts most. Now, there is one exception to this, and that is bankruptcy. So if you have a bankruptcy, that will actually stay on your credit report for 10 years. So that's one of the few things that doesn't sunset at the seven-year mark. So what counts towards your credit history? Anything that's really a loan, and that might sound really obvious, but sometimes people get confused about that. So credit cards absolutely are loans. You're borrowing money against a credit card that you need to pay back. What about mortgages? Absolutely. Those things will count. Maybe personal loans. If you've taken an auto loan, anything that is a loan or a line of credit will absolutely count towards your credit report. But there are a number of things that don't count that a lot of us think that they do. For example, your rent, if you pay your rent on time or you pay it late, often that does not go to your credit report. Your cell phone, it's not really a loan by the cell phone company. You're just paying for the service that you're using each month. So they typically do not report back to the credit bureau. Strangely, they might actually pull your credit in order to approve you for a cell phone plan, but usually they do not report back that you're making payments on time. And then the other category here is utilities. Often your gas bill, your electric or water bill, if you're on time or late, those things don't get reported back. Now, Because a lot of these things can actually reflect well on you, if you're paying these things on time, those are obligations, nonetheless, they're not loans. They're still obligations that you're continuing to meet and you're not really getting credit for those. So there's actually a couple of new products out there, Ultra FICO and Experian Boost, which will connect your bank accounts and watch for these transactions and use those in the calculation of your credit score. So if you're paying these on time, You've been really diligent about them. You may want to consider using some of these products to improve your credit score. But one of the hacks around this is that you don't have to do that. So even though paying these things does not count, doesn't get recorded in that credit history, one of the things that you can do is pay them through a loan or a credit card that would be recorded. So if I pay my cell phone bill on my credit card and then I pay my credit card, my credit card will report that they receive the payment in full. So That's one way to get some of that activity, some of those transactions on your credit report. Now, what else doesn't count? There's been some recent changes over the past year or so here where medical debts don't quite count the way they used to. Now, there are some stipulations here. For the first 100 days, say if you get a procedure and you have an outstanding bill, it won't go on your credit report. And of course, then if you pay it off, it also won't go on there. So no negative effects there. But even if you do have an outstanding overdue bill through a medical provider, now credit reporting underweights that. So they don't put as much weight on that as they used to. And this is important because medical debts can often be very large. If you have a two or three thousand dollar credit card balance and then a 30 or 40, 50 thousand dollar medical bill, that can be a really big debt. One of the nice things that they do is now underweight it. Now, this also leads to some other tactics that you can use to help optimize your credit score. So we'll talk a little bit about this in just a little while here. So one of the questions is how do you improve your credit score? And there's a couple of easy, low hanging fruit tactics to do this. One is the authorized user route. Now an authorized user means that someone has say a credit line or a loan, most often a credit card. And what they do is they add a person to them as an authorized user. Now what this means is that person does not own the credit card, they aren't a partner in it. They have no legal obligation to it. This is often done, say, if a parent sends some child to school, they may add them as an authorized user to their credit card. And that person, the child would get a credit card with the credit card number and they'd be able to use it. And they'd be able to charge whatever they want to it. Now, there's some pros and cons to this. First of all, the person who owns the credit card, in this case, owns all the responsibility of it. And an authorized user can charge whatever they want to it. But the authorized user doesn't have any obligation to it, one. So they also don't get the full benefit of being tied to that credit card. So they won't get the full payment history value and things like that. The other thing is if the primary owner of that credit card is not a good credit risk, if they don't pay very often or pay on time, you may not want to be an authorized user on that. And then also the owner of that credit card can cancel authorized user access at any time. So you might lose it. Let's say someone 
adds you as an authorized user to a card. You might get a little bump if that's a good arrangement for you, good history in your credit report. But then if they say, hey, I'm going to cancel this credit card or I don't want you to have it, it's just too much of a risk, and they take you off, you actually might lose all those benefits. So another option here is the joint account or co-signer. So again, let's use the credit card example here. Let's say a husband and a wife or two spouses or partners apply for a credit card together. They are joint partners on it. They both have an obligation to it. They can both use it. But if one person stops paying, the other person is still legally obligated. And so this means that uh, people can go after either party in the collection. So you get the most benefit. You get all that on-time payment history. You get the credit availability and the credit utilization and all of those things. But you also have all of the obligations to it. Just some pros and cons here. Joint co-signer relationships usually have the biggest impact to your score. So especially say a child with a parent wants a good credit history, maybe they'll go into a joint account as opposed to an authorized user arrangement. So all these things are definitely possible, but they come with some risks as well. Another way to improve your credit is a prepaid or secured credit card. Now, what this is, just like any other card, usually it will be branded MasterCard or Visa. And what you will do is you will send in money. You will make a payment to the credit card even before you've used it. And so the money that you have put onto the card, it's kind of like loading a cash card, say $200, your credit limit on this card is going to be $200. That means you can go out and charge up to $200 and it won't accept any charges beyond that. And then you can make a payment to pay off that balance and the secured credit cards will report, hey, payment received. And the reason they will do that is because they have really no risk. You've already prepaid for that credit line. And so if you never send in a payment, they'll just keep the money that you've sent in. But if you make that payment, they will report good payment. So it's one way for people who may be coming out of bankruptcy or something like this, and they can't get credit any other way. They can often get a secured credit card because there's very little risk for the institutions on it. Another way is to possibly go out and get a small loan. So maybe an online place, Rocket Loans, I think will offer loans as little as $2,000. So there are a lot of online lenders that might offer $500 loan. So one way to improve your credit is to take a loan for whatever you can get and make the payments on time to it. And to not just take a loan just for that and to only borrow as much as you absolutely need, but to start off with a small loan can be a good payment history as well. Now, if you can't get it from a traditional lender, one of the other things that you might want to look at are peer-to-peer -peer lending services. So things like Prosper and Lending Club are some online sites where you can go and apply for money. And what will end up happening is that the other users fund your loan request. So uh, if you want to borrow $1,000, a 1,000 people might each pitch in a dollar to fund your loan. Now, this is good for a couple of reasons. One, individuals don't have the same lending requirements that banks do. So sometimes banks will just get to a certain credit score and say, hey, we don't lend to anyone below this. And so if you're below that, you might be out of options there. But because people are different, you might be able to get a loan from the peer-to-peer -peer network, but you might get it at a higher interest rate, right? Even though you might get the funding, you might have to pay that higher interest rate. Now, there's another issue with this is that a lot of these online peer-to-peer -peer lenders don't report to all the credit bureaus. Some don't even report to any of the credit bureaus, but sometimes Prosper and Lending Club, I think only report to one credit bureau. So you just have to understand that this might not show up on every credit report, might only show up at one bureau. There's three of them, but it might be a good way to start too. So some might be better than none in this case. And then there's another thing called a money pool. People can deposit money into this pool. They're not as common in the United States as they are overseas, but if you can't get a small loan in some of these other fashions, you might be able to get one through a money pool. All right. So as I mentioned, two strategies here, pay on time and pay it down. And you might be saying, Pete, that sounds really simple, but I will tell you what, paying on time and paying your balance down is predicated on what? It's predicated on the idea that you can afford to make the payments. So if you can't afford it, if you're struggling to make the payment on time because you're sending in as much as you can, but it's not enough to make the minimum payment, I would suggest a couple of things. So if you have a credit card, there's a number to customer service on the back of it. I would absolutely reach out to them, explain to them that you are doing what you can, that you want to work with them. They will usually either make an adjustment to the interest rate. If you've never gotten an interest rate adjustment before, sometimes they will work with you on a payment arrangement. So feel free to reach out to customer service on that. The other thing you can do is potentially get a personal loan. So there are some websites out there. I think Rocket Loans is one. Goldman Sachs has a personal loan company called Marcus. There are a number of places online to get them. And what you will usually be able to do is get a single loan that you can pay off some debt. 
Now, the interest rates are usually higher, but they're usually not as high as credit card interest rates. So if you're paying off some credit card debt, this could actually be an advantage to you. You can spread out the loan usually over three, four or five years to get those payments just to an affordable point and then pay that off over time. The other option here, which is similar, is debt management. Now, there are some different types of strategies. There's debt settlement, debt management, debt consolidation. I'm only talking about debt management here, which is a service. A company will take all of your debts, look at your cash flow, negotiate on your behalf for specific interest rates or payments, and then they will bill you. You'll have to pay the debt management company one payment each month, and then they will satisfy the requirement to all of your lenders. And so that's something that might be helpful to you. I'll talk a little bit more in detail about that in just a moment here. And the other thing is, think about it from not just trying to cut the cost, but what can you do on the income side here? Maybe get a side hustle, maybe make some extra money. Just babysitting one night a week can also bring in an extra 50, 60, 80, 100 bucks in an evening. There are a lot of options here to bring in a little extra cash, but that extra cash, whether it's $50 a month or $100 a month or a few hundred dollars a month can make a big difference. So the other thing I want to suggest here is to make sure that it's correct. There are a number of apps and services out there that you can go and set up a free account to see your credit history. Credit Karma is an app that you can download or go onto their website. You can go in there. You can see your live advantage score. You can also see the number of accounts that it is registering with their bureau. You can see how your credit score has done over time. You can see the latest balances. So if you've made some payments on things, you'll see those balances come down over time. The other thing that I really like about it is that you can just make sure that things that are paid off are showing is paid off. Or if you see any accounts that you don't recognize, you can give them a call to figure out if that's legitimate. You also want to be sure that no one is stealing your identity, that there's no fraud happening using your social security number. And so if you see something like that, it can be worth tracking down. Now, one of the things that I really love about services like Credit Karma, or Credit Wise, and these other credit services is that they usually will give you alert notifications on your phone. So every time I apply for a new credit card or a new loan, what ends up happening is I usually get an alert that pops up on my phone saying a new inquiry has been detected, which is great because if I'm doing it and I see that, I know it's great. I know it's fine. But if something pops up and I'm not doing anything, that's a great alert for me to take a look and maybe head off some nefarious activity. So let me quick switch gears here and talk about some of the most common mistakes. The first one is what I call not calling. So let's say you have a bill that is due and you notice that it's due on June 15th and it is now June 17th. You just forgot you're about to pay it. Don't just pay it. My recommendation here would be give the lender a call, give the person that's receiving it a call, let them know. Usually they will mark it into the system. Sometimes there's just an automated thing that goes back to the credit bureau that says the payment was received late. Often an operator can undo that or intercept it. It's usually worth the call, especially if it's something that's a one-off that doesn't happen. People are usually very accommodating on the other end. And so make that phone call. The other thing I will say here is canceling old credit cards. So if you have a bunch of old credit cards, you said, hey, I've been working really hard to pay these off. And now I just want you to call and cancel them and be rid of them. That might not be the best strategy. In fact, this kind of speaks to that second piece, credit utilization, paying it down. Let me give you a quick example here. Let's say you have a new credit card with a $2,000 limit and you have an old credit card you don't even use anymore and then had the $2,000 limit, but you're putting some money on the new credit card. So what you end up having here is by the credit bureau standards, you have a $4,000 available credit limit. It's on two different cards, but still they see $4,000 is available. Now you use that one credit card, let's say you have a $1,000 balance. The credit report shows that you're only using 25% of your available credit. Now, if you go and cancel that old credit card, all of a sudden, instead of $4,000 credit limit, you have a $2,000 credit limit. And instead of 25%, you're using 50% of your available credit. So the utilization number is higher. And unfortunately, what the credit bureaus like to see is you under 30% utilization. So if you have a $100 credit line, what they want to see is that you're not using more than $30 of it. And if you can keep it even lower than that, that's even better. So the other thing here is reopening old debts. And I don't see this as often, but sometimes people, especially when they feel obligated, they have a kind of a conscience about some of their old debts, want to kind of work against their best interest here. So let's say you bought something a long time ago, you borrowed some money, let's say you bought a VCR back in the day and you forgot to pay it, it's it's overdue, it went delinquent, it went to collections, now you're not even hearing about it. There is a statute of limitations on how long collectors can try to collect on a debt. And that varies from state to state. So definitely check with your own state. 
But one of the things that can happen is if they can't collect on it, it's not showing up on your credit report. It's often just written off. It's written off as bad debt by the lender, which you can inadvertently do is if you say, Hey, I knew I owed that debt. And now I've fallen into some money. I want to pay that off. And you call and you say, Hey, I have this old debt. I want to send in a payment of $20 to make good on it. That is new activity on that debt. And that might actually reopen it and start the clock again. So if you're dealing with really old debts and you are thinking about addressing them, I would definitely reach out to a professional debt counselor in the space and explain the situation to them and see what they suggest. The number four most common mistake is converting medical debts. Like I said, let's say you went to a hospital, medical provider, you got service. Now you have this bill, you have them calling because they want you to make payments on it. You've got this balance that is hanging over your head. A lot of people just want to be done with the calls and they'll put it on their credit card. And I would say, don't do that. In fact, if you owe money to a medical provider at this point, remember I said it doesn't count for 180 days. And if it is overdue, it is underweighted compared to other debts. So what you don't want to do is really remove it from the medical provider because it will weigh less on your credit score. What I would suggest is reaching out to that medical provider, work with them, work with their customer service, their accounts receivable to come up with a payment plan, keep the debt there and work with them to come up with a payment arrangement so that you can stay on top of it. So we'll stop reporting it because it's probably going to be a lower interest rate. They might even give you a discount. They're probably going to be very accommodating. Medical debt is very common. In fact, they usually have people that specialize in making arrangements with you based on what you can afford. So I would keep it there when at all possible. The another one is avoiding debt management. I know we talked about this a little earlier in the presentation here. And if you're dealing with a bunch of debts, maybe the bills are due on different times. Maybe you pay some of those bills on time, but some of them get paid late. It may be worth seeing a debt management organization. Now there are a number of good ones out there. There are some more less reputable ones that would definitely read reviews about them. If you're seeing them, but the, what they will do is they'll usually assign you a debt counselor who will look at your income with you, look at all your bills. They'll come up with a budget. They will crunch the numbers for you. And what they will usually do then is put all those bills in one bucket and they will bill you directly and they will satisfy all of those bills as you send in your monthly payments. So you'll have one monthly payment and then they will distribute the money out to those people. And usually here, the debts will be paid off within five years. So you can be debt free theoretically in five years. And it's an obligation. And it's one of those things that if you do it, you know, you're going to be obligated to it. If you missed any of those, the whole thing can be undone. So you want to be really clear and work with them and be really honest about what you have so that uh, you can make sure that you can afford the payment and stay on top of it. But that can be a really helpful situation from just getting out from underneath the mess, underneath the collection calls and the piles of bills. And then a few of the last ones here is not applying. So to avoid inquiry. So a lot of people will say, well, I don't want to apply for a personal loan because then that's going to ding my credit score. Hey, if you need a loan, if you need a personal loan or a consolidation loan or something like that, that's in your best interest. You should do it regardless of what it's going to do to the credit report. And this ties into the next one, obsessing about your credit score. So a lot of people will just obsess so much about not doing something that's going to hurt their score or trying to do things that are not in their best interest, spending money from savings just to make a payment on a bill, but then not have money to put food on the table just to try to keep the score optimal. So don't obsess too much about the score. Do what's right for you. And what I mean by that is don't do things where you're working against your best interest. So I said, you don't want to close credit cards. One of the things that you can do here is old credit cards. You can just cut them up so that you don't use them, that you can't even use them. You might not even know what the number is, but I will tell you what, if having those old credit cards is temptation for you and you are inclined to use them, then I would close them. Even though that's not necessarily the optimal thing to do for your credit utilization, if that's the best thing for you personally to keep you from being your own worst enemy, then absolutely do it. Put your priorities and your needs first on this. And in that vein too, bankruptcy is a viable option. If you are under so much debt, if you're saddled by so much of it that you can't get out of it, or you're going to be paying on it until you retire, that's probably not a situation you want to be in. And I know that bankruptcy will hit your credit score too, probably about 150 points, but it may be the best option for you. So don't avoid the options or exploring the options that might be good for you in the long run, just because they might do something negative on your credit score in the short run. And then be patient. It takes a long time to move that score up. It's going to take a lot of good payment history to replace that old payment history, but you'll see the benefits and that progress over time. And where are we going to focus our time? Again, pay on time, 
It's that payment history that's really important. And then pay it down. If you have a balance on something, send in some extra money if you've got it. Just be diligent about paying that down, refinancing, get the lowest interest rates you absolutely can. This little chart here I really like. It actually shows you five bands, excellent, good, fair, poor, and very poor of the credit scores. And so if you want to be in the good range, these are the items you need to have a good credit score. So I mentioned that utilization of credit should be under 30%. So if you look right here, where we see it saying good, 29% to 10%. If you're using 10 to 30% of your credit card and usually no more, you'll probably be in that good range. But if you want to be excellent, which I hope you strive for, you're going to want to be under 10%. So yes, the threshold here is 30% to get in this good range. But if you really want to shoot for these, that's important. And how about payment history? To be in the good range, you're going to have to pay 99% of those payments on time and 100% of those payments on time to be an excellent. Even 98% is going to put you in the fair category in here. So what you can see is the different categories here. So it's a little bit like a checklist. If you want to improve your score, focus on some of these. So this will really help to continue to move your score over time. Now, I have a participant. Her name is Jane. Obviously, her name's changed for this particular story, but she came to me, had a large credit card balance. She was behind on her utility payments. In fact, some of the utilities were getting shut off. She had stopped paying on her student loans and her credit score was in the bad range. And so what we did is we started working on some of the things that we could tackle right away. So look at changing the spending to try to free up some cash, pay some of those utilities on time. She went on a payment plan with the utilities. She actually called her student loan servicer to go into rehabilitation. Her loan was in default there. And as time went on and she was starting to get caught up on these things, her credit score also started going up. In fact, just getting that student loan default off of her report was a nice little boost at when she got through rehabilitation. So now she's down to the last 10% of the balance on the credit card. She is out of rehabilitation on her student loan. She's actually in an income-based repayment plan. So she's got a, a payment that she can afford each month. She's paid off her car. And so all of these debts now are starting to go away. She's getting good payment history and that's being reflected in her credit score here. And I'm really happy to say that she's in the high 600s now, knocking on the door of good, continuing to have more of that good history, replacing that old history is going to pay some dividends and it's really showing progress. So hopefully we've gone through a number of things here, giving you some ideas on how to improve your credit score, some tactics there, but then also looking at some of the most common ways that people hurt themselves, even though they think they're going to help themselves. So hopefully you've gotten some tips that you can use here and come visit us out at the website. Thanks so much.